Berlin Prison, July 11, 1958. The cell door is opened. A man enters and Peter Manuel feels his arms being roughly forced behind his back. His feet stumble. He is led just a few paces into an adjacent cell, then pushed onto the awaiting scaffold. A white cap is placed over his head, followed by the noose. I'll go quietly if you turn the radio up. I'm Jess, and this is Skinwalker. Peter Thomas Anthony Manuel was born in the Misericordia Hospital on March 13, 1927, to Scottish parents living in Manhattan, New York. He was the couple's second child, arriving after his older brother James, who had been left with relatives in Scotland when his parents had emigrated. His father Sam was a welder by trade, and his mother Bridget was a stay-at-home mum. His family moved around America after arriving, moving to Detroit, Michigan, where his father worked in the automotive industry, amongst other stops. The family, however, migrated back to Scotland in 1932 due to Sam's deteriorating health. With Sam ill, Bridget wanted to move back to Scotland to have family close by. Upon their return, the family settled in Birkinshaw in North Lanarkshire, a small village situated on the outskirts of Glasgow's East End. In 1934, the family expanded and the Manuals had a daughter, Teresa. While growing up in Birkinshaw, Peter attended Our Lady of Good Aid Catholic School in Motherwell, a local town won over from Birkinshaw. Peter had been sent to the school as a result of poor discipline at a local Birkinshaw school. He was known as a bright young student, but was also prone to skipping school and causing fights. The family was once again uprooted in 1938 and moved 300 miles from Birkinshaw to Coventry in central England, as Sam, having recovered from his severe ill health, desperately searched for work to provide for his wife and three children. Peter struggled with the move down to Coventry. Having grown up in America, then Glasgow, he found it difficult to understand the locals, just as the locals found it difficult to understand him. His frustration grew quickly to anger and resentment for his situation. It was only a year later, in 1949, at the tender age of 12, that Peter Manuel would have his first brush with the law. He had been caught for shoplifting, breaking and entering, and larceny, crimes for which he was sentenced to serve 12 months at an approved school. An approved school was, at the time, a term to describe a residential institution for troubled children. However, the young Manuel was too cunning for the measures at these institutions and was able to escape from these schools almost at will. As a result, he was moved around at several intervals during these 12 months. Manuel once again found himself in trouble with the law at the beginning of 1942. He had broken into his teacher's home, upon which he had attacked the teacher's wife with a candlestick holder. Disturbed in the process and chased from the scene, he proceeded to hide in the school's nativity scene to avoid being caught. For this attack, he was later charged with assault and breaking and entering. Around this time, Peter also began to complain of memory problems and blackouts. He had allegedly had several incidents for which he appeared to have no recollection. He had attended a boxing match for which he claimed he knew no result. He also had no memory of having driven a truck to Preston from Blackpool. This was exacerbated by a traumatic head injury which he had sustained during the period. As this was in the midst of World War II, Coventry was under severe attack by German bombers. During one raid, Manuel either suffered a traumatic blow to the head as a result of a falling piece of steel, 
or severe injury to his brain through electrocution, depending on which version of events is to be believed. In defence of the electrocution theory, Manuel's medical records made a note of burn marks on his hands which could be consistent with severe electrocution. No matter which version is believed, it is an absolute truth that Peter Manuel had a severe and worsening issue with his memory and blackouts. By June 24, 1942, Manuel was in trouble once again. Only 15, he appeared at Southport Juvenile Court on three charges of breaking into local houses. Along with this, there was a charge of unlawful wounding. He had broken into a house late at night and when he stumbled upon a sleeping victim in her bed, he viciously attacked her with a hammer which he had wrapped in a handkerchief. It was also revealed in court that after the attack, the woman's purse had gone missing and had likely been taken by Manuel. On his 16th birthday, Peter Manuel was sentenced to two years to be served in a borstal in Rochester, a town around 30 miles east of London. A borstal was a youth detention centre intended to reform young offenders. They were run by Her Majesty's prison service and were more commonly known as a youth prison. During this time, his family became increasingly concerned about the safety of Coventry due to the frequent bombing raids in the area and returned to Uddingston, a town nearby to their native Birkinshaw in Scotland. In March 1945, Manuel was released and immediately returned north of the border to be with his family. Manuel's attempts to stay out of trouble in Scotland, however, were short-lived. Less than one year later, in February 1946, he was arrested for breaking into a home and stealing a watch. His father, Sam Manuel, stumped up what was a rather considerable fee for the time of £60 for his son's bail and Peter was released on February 21 after spending only four days in prison. On March 3, 1946, a mother walking home with her three-year-old child late at night walked along an unlit lane that was used as a shortcut between Mount Vernon Avenue and Carrick Drive in Glasgow's East End. Halfway between the two streets, she was grabbed and overpowered by a man who had emerged from the darkness. As she fought back, she screamed hysterically. The pair tussled and after colliding with a barbed wire fence, the shadowy figure ran off. Her child stood stock still, terrified by the incident and the noises surrounding them. However, within seconds the man had re-emerged and began to run back towards her. He kicked the woman violently to the ground before running off again and then finally disappearing for good. The woman gave police a statement in the aftermath of the crime and they were confident they had a reasonably good suspect in mind. However, when they went to investigate the suspect, no traces of them could be found. Four days later, at around 9.30pm, after finishing her shift at a local hospital, a young nurse was walking home along a lit public walkway on Calder Road, Bells Hill, only six miles from the attack in Glasgow's East End. She was struck in the face by a man walking towards her. The man covered her face during the attack and warned her not to scream. During the struggle, both fell into a hedge at the side of the road. As a motorbike passed by, the assailant was spooked and ran off into nearby woods. The survivor had escaped with only a blow to the head. 24 hours after the attack on Calder Road, the attacker struck again. A 26-year-old woman had gotten off the bus and started to walk along Fallside Road, Bovwell, just minutes from her home. As she had gotten off of the bus, the woman had noticed a man lingering at the bus stop but had no reason to suspect anything suspicious. A couple minutes later, she glanced back and was met with the sight of the same young man from the bus stop, who was by now walking closely behind her. Knowing that she had seen him, 
the young man ran at the woman, punching her in the head and pulling her to the ground. He grunted at her to stay quiet. As the struggle continued, the woman bit the hand of the attacker, but this only served to anger him as he became furious and smashed her head off of the ground several times. The woman offered up her money to appease the attacker in the hope that this was just a robbery. It wasn't. The attacker wasn't interested in her money. The woman was dragged up from the ground and forced to a railway embankment. Once there, the attacker threw her to the ground, breaking her false teeth. Then he tore off her clothes and viciously raped her. After this, he tied her scarf around her eyes and ran off. It later transpired that the woman had recently suffered from and was in the process of recovery for tuberculosis and a hysterectomy. When the survivor reported the incident to local police, she was able to provide a description of what she could remember. This tallied with the previous two attacks and consisted of a young man with dark hair who was well dressed and a description of the sound of his voice. This third description given led police to arrange a visit to Peter Manuel. When they called at his house on March 9, 1946, he was arrested to be questioned. After investigations and interviews, all three women were involved in an identity lineup to pick out their attacker. Unlike modern setups behind mirrored glass, Scottish identification parades at the time involved walking up and down a line of men and tapping the relevant party on the shoulder. Only one of the three women positively identified Peter Manu as their attacker. Despite the proximity of all three attacks, the Crown chose to proceed only with trying the physical rape allegation. Had all three attacks been brought forward to court, Manu may well have been looking at a significantly longer sentence. Only 12 days later, on March 21st, Peter Manuel was convicted of 15 charges of breaking and entering, unrelated to the sexual assault and rape attacks, and sentenced to 12 months in prison. On June 26 of that year, Peter Manuel appeared at Glasgow High Court to face the charges concerning the free sex attacks in March. The then 19-year-old Manuel elected to represent himself, a statement which was met by considerable interest from the public gallery. Manuel led a defence that he was wrongly accused and entirely innocent. The crime scene information, however, disagreed. Detectives were able to trace two prominent sets of footprints at one of the crime scenes. There were two separate sets of footprints which then led off in entirely different directions. Police were able to find out the make and size of the shoe from the shoe print and compared this information to shoes taken from Peter Manuel's property during a search. There was a match. Further evidence which pointed firmly towards Peter Manuel's guilt was brought forward in the court proceedings. This included fibres from the survivor's scarf on the night of the attack which had been found on Manuel's clothes and dust and dirt particles consistent with that of the crime scene. At the very least, Peter Manuel's presence at the crime scene was not in question. The jury of his peers was left to determine whether he had further raped the survivor. The jury found Peter Manuel guilty of the rape of the survivor on March 8, 1946. The judge sentenced him to eight years imprisonment, which was to begin after the conclusion of his year-long sentence for the burglaries. While serving his time in Peterhead Prison, Manuel pretended to other inmates that he was a safe blower. He was released early in 1952, having served seven years of his eight-year sentence. At the age of 26, he was returned to Glasgow as a free man. Over the next year, it genuinely seemed the time in prison had reformed Manuel. He had received a job at a gas board company, then a position on the railway, and in 1954 he met Anna O'Hare, a Glasgow bus conductress, and embarked on a whirlwind romance. She was a beautiful woman and kind. 
It is presumed that she did not know of Manuel's sexual assaults or indeed his criminal past. Manuel was generous and loving to Anna and was well liked by her family who believed he was a well dressed, well spoken and smart young man. They were engaged on May 20, 1955 and set a date to wed on July 30th of the same year. Manuel proposed with a ring which Anna had selected at an expensive jewellery store. However, he later swapped it for a cheaper alternative without her knowledge, showing his deceiving nature was not entirely in the past. At this time, Manuel was also supplying information as a police informant. However, most of the information he had passed to authorities was later described as quote, baseless. Peter and Anna's relationship eventually failed. The reasons behind the breakup of the relationship between the two have never been confirmed. It was likely due to religious beliefs. Anna's family were devout Catholics, as were Manuel's, but by this point in his life, Peter had entirely turned his back on religion. Anna called off the engagement on July 29th, only a day before the scheduled wedding. Peter did not take the news well and became a drunken thief within his workplace in the period following. On the date that Manuel was due to wed Anna O'Hare, July 30, 1955, he abducted and assaulted a 29-year-old woman, Mary McLachlan. Mary had been at a local dance in the nearby town of Blantyre. Only a few minutes walk from her home, Peter Manuel sprang out of the darkness and covered her mouth with his hand, holding a knife to her throat. After forcing Mary to a nearby field, he lay with her for over an hour, groping her. He held the knife to her throat throughout. Mary claimed that Manuel stated he was drunk and that he was meant to be married on that very day. He further mentioned to his terrified victim that she bore such a resemblance to his former flame Anna that he had lost control. After the attack, he joked that they must travel on the same bus and even offered to walk Mary home. Mary McLachlan reported this incident to police and gave a description of her attacker. She did not have the name of her attacker but had in fact recognised him as travelling on the same bus as her during her morning commute to work. Police were quick to identify Peter Manuel and once again placed him under arrest. The case against Manuel was strong. A knife had been found in the field at the scene of the attack and once examined had contained Peter Manuel's fingerprints. Added to this, police had recovered blood-stained clothing from Manuel's home. The blood type of the stain matched Mary's. Manuel was undeterred by the mounting evidence. He once again chose to represent himself at court. Manuel admitted that he did know the victim and that they had in fact been in a relationship, but they had had an argument and in the course of this he had hit her, splitting her lip which would be the reason for the blood found on his clothing. He admitted to having a knife on him, stating that it was merely to check rabbit traps he had laid within the field in question. He further claimed that Mary McLachlan was a scorned ex-girlfriend who was now looking to put him behind bars. His ploy, as ludicrous as it sounded, worked. The verdict the jury reached was one of not guilty and Manuel would walk free. Mary McLachlan was shunned by her community for false accusations, becoming the talking point for local gossip and was even later spat on by Peter's father, Sam. Peter Manuel had learned a valuable lesson that day. He would never leave witnesses again. On January 4, 1956, a local dog walker named George Gribben was walking through the snow-covered East Kilbride golf course around 3pm when he noticed something lying on the ground near the fifth tee. Upon closer inspection, it was a female lying dead, her bruised and battered body frozen due to the exceedingly cold weather. Her head had been split open, 
and police were able to identify from the available forensic that she had run from the nearby road into the golf course as she attempted to escape her attacker. The body was identified as that of a local girl, Anne Neelands. Anne was fair haired and pretty and was only 17 years old at the time of her death, the oldest of six children. Anne had been missing for two days. Her family had told police she had planned to meet a man she had previously met at a local dance. Anne's sister was also at the dance, however, was only able to provide a basic description of the man Anne was going to meet. She described his characteristics and that the man was called Private Andrew Murnan, a local lad who was conscripted. Anne had told Alice that she intended to meet the man at a bus terminal in East Kilbride at 6pm where they would then take a bus into Glasgow city centre. Anne left her home at around 5.20pm to walk to the bus terminal, but after her date failed to show for their agreed 6pm meeting time, she decided to wait for the next bus at 6.45pm, hoping that her suitor was merely running late. When he didn't arrive, she visited family friends, the Simpsons, who lived locally to the bus terminal. They recalled that she had stated she missed her bus and was going to wait for the next one. She left at 6.40pm to head back to the bus terminal. Anne's parents had been out in Glasgow celebrating at the time and had not been overly concerned with her not returning that evening as it was assumed she may have stayed at a friend's house. When Anne had still not returned by January 4th, her parents reported her missing to the police. Anne had run from the nearby road into the golf course, losing a shoe in the mud as she ran. In the darkness, she had run into a barbed wire fence, causing lacerations to her face and arms. Another shoe was found as she had run from the fence. Footprints discovered in the mud showed that she had run barefoot before being caught by her attacker. Once caught, she was raped and then brutally murdered. The ground where she was killed was saturated in blood and fragments of her skull were found around the area. The body was later moved, presumably by the killer, sometime between the murder and the discovery of Anne's body. Anne's possessions had also been scattered around the murder site. A sinister development took place on January 4th, whereby one of the Simpson family daughters had found Anne's purse at the back of their farm which suggested that the killer may have been tracking the girl from an earlier stage of the evening. Police drew up a potential list of suspects, and Peter Manuel once again took a high position of interest. When questioned, Manuel was noted to have scratches on his face and had been working on a construction project next to East Kilbride Golf Course when the murder took place. Manuel, however, stated that he had an alibi for the night in question, According to his statement, he had been home all night on the 2nd and his father willingly confirmed this story to police. Police accepted this carefully crafted alibi contrived by Manuel and his father and he was released and never questioned again in connection with the murder. Manuel's game of cat and mouse with the police was far from over. On September 15, 1956, he broke into yet another house this time one on Fens Bank Avenue in Glasgow's Burnside area. Luckily for the residents of the household, they were not at home at the time and very little was stolen. The house was owned by sisters Margaret and Mary Martin. Despite the low volume of stolen goods, the house itself had been turned upside down and a bowl of soup had been emptied over the floor. One item the pair noticed to be missing was a pair of nylon tights. On the same street, the Watt family had moved in only two months earlier and were enjoying life in the quiet residential area. The Watt family consisted of Father William, Mother Marion and daughter Vivian. William Watt owned a bakery in Glasgow's East End and had decided to take a fishing trip around the time of September 17th. Marion Watt, his wife, was at home that evening along with her daughter Vivian and her sister Margaret Brown. 
Vivian's friend Diana Valente was also in the house that evening as they had listened to records together before her leaving around 11.40pm. Peter Manuel had made the Watt family home on Fensbank Avenue as his next target. He used his skills garnered from previous break-ins to smash through the front door panel in the early hours of the morning without causing a stir in the house. He made his way to Marion Watt's bedroom where he shot her in the head with a revolver pistol. He then shot Margaret Brown who had been sleeping next to her sister. Margaret's wounds suggest she may have woken from the sound of the first shot as she was shot twice by Manuel. Marion's nightdress had been lifted while Margaret's pyjama trousers had been torn, suggesting that Manuel still had sexual interest in the woman even after the shooting. Vivian's room was just down the corridor and it was there Manuel was headed. Vivian had been hit on the head and tied with her hands behind her back before being shot. Her pyjama trousers had also been ripped. A smoked cigarette was found on the carpet, suggesting that Manuel had coolly taken the time to stop and have a cigarette before leaving. The bodies were discovered the following day by the Watts housekeeper, Helen Collison. After seeing the broken glass and having no response to her knocking on the window, she went to the next door neighbour, who was Diana Valenti's mother. Both women went to the front door where they were also joined by a postman. The postman reached through the broken panel to unlock the door. After discovering the horrific scene which lay in front of them, the police were called. The postman heard noises from Vivian's room and rushed to see the source. It transpired that in addition to the horror of seeing the two sisters dead in their bed, the postman was also subjected to watching Vivian draw her final breaths before her passing. Quickly linking the break-in on the same street, the police believed whoever was responsible for that crime would also be responsible for the murder. As Peter Manuel was well known now for this type of crime, the police went straight to his home with a search warrant for the 38 revolver. Peter denied the accusation and was backed up for the night of the murder by his father, who further stated that he had nothing to do with the crime. Police were unable to find anything in their search. As such, they failed to charge Peter Manuel with anything. William Watt was informed of the murder by his brother John and reportedly broke down before being driven back to Glasgow by police. During this drive, police were concerned by the behaviour of William. Instead of being the broken man they expected after hearing of the death of his wife and daughter, they reported that he had a smirk on his face and shed no tears. An article in a Scottish newspaper reported that the police's investigations had led them to believe that the deceased had recognised their killer, only adding to the belief that William Watt had a part to play in this tragedy. With the break-in link now being ignored, on September 28th, just three days after the funeral of his family, and without a great deal of evidence, police charged William Watt with the triple murder. He appeared at Glasgow Sheriff Court and did not speak throughout his hearing. Watt's defence was that he had spent the night of the murders meeting friends and watching television before having drinks with the owners of the Cairnban Hotel, where he had stayed. A hotel waitress reported seeing Watt at his window around 1am. Another waitress then confirmed seeing Watt scraping ice from his windscreen at 8.10am, meaning that Watt would have had to drive 180 miles and commit three murders in the time between and be back in suitable time to allow the windscreen of the car to freeze back over. While possible, this would have been an incredibly unlikely timeline of events. During this period, the police were able to garner enough evidence to charge Manuel with the break-in at the Martin household on Fensbank Avenue before the triple murder. He was sentenced to 13 months in prison. Despite going to jail for the break-in, Peter Manuel must now have felt invincible. He had gotten away with the murder of Anne Neelands and now William Watt had been pinned as the sole suspect for the triple murder. At this point, however, he made the very unwise decision to insert himself within the case. 
he wrote to the police claiming he knew who had committed the murders and contacted newspapers claiming the same. Although, once pushed, he claimed he was not able to name the man. After serving his sentence, Manuel continued to play the role of the smartest agitator in the room. He convinced a local lawyer, Lawrence Dowdle, to set up a meeting with the now exculpated William Watt. When the three sat down to lunch, Watt threatened to kill Manuel, given that word on the street was it was Manuel who had committed the triple murder of his family. Manuel rebuked the man, stating that he knew of the criminal element which had been involved, but he had been far removed from the situation. He met again with William Watt to name the criminal element as a man called Charles Tallis. He gave an in-depth description of the crime and previous crimes which the fabricated Tallis has reportedly committed. Watt, now sure of Manuel's guilt, mentally noted all the details and resolved to use them to ensure Manuel swung from the gallows, should he ever have the chance. Taunting victims' families and playing cat and mouse with newspapers and the police would only have kept Manuel entertained for so long. On December 28, 1957, he struck again. Isabel Cook, a 17-year-old girl from Mount Vernon, Glasgow, was going to a dance in Uddingston for the evening with her boyfriend, Douglas Bryden, whom she was going to meet there. Isabel left home to catch the 7.30pm bus to take her the short journey. The route that Isabel took to the bus stop was a shortcut across a railway and then a footpath to cut through streets. This footpath was the very same where Peter Manuel had attacked a woman and her child 11 years previous. Douglas Bryden waited outside of the dance hall for Isabel for 45 minutes before concluding that she would not be coming and headed inside alone. Isabel's family, meanwhile, were at home and had assumed that as Isabel had not returned, she had chosen to stay with a friend. The home phone was out of order that night, meaning they were unable to check in with any of Isabel's friends. Isabel's father, William, was unable to sleep with worry and reported her missing to police. Items were found in the following days which the cooks confirmed belonged to Isabel and she had left the house wearing them. There were still no signs of Isabel. Newspapers ran articles daily about the disappearance and kept people up to date with the case. However, Isabel's place at the forefront of locals' minds would change on January 6, 1958 when another tragedy was discovered. Peter Smart his wife Doris and their 11 year old son Michael were found dead by police after a check on the home. Peter had failed to turn up for work on January 6th and staff had called police noting it was very out of character. The three bodies were discovered all with a shot to the head and had lay undiscovered for six days judging by their state of decomposition. Neighbours reported that despite the state of decomposition noting this, this seemed improbable. In the time since January 1st, there had been signs of life in the home. Mr Jackman, who lived across the road from the Smart family, stated that at varying times curtains had been raised and lowered. He further noted that lights were switched on and off in different rooms. One thing that Mr Jackman's wife had noted as strange was that the curtains were drawn unevenly, which was unusual for a woman as house proud as Doris Smart. The police came to the horrifying realisation that somebody was living in the Smarts house for the days following their brutal murder. Police combed the area for clues and a possible murder weapon. This time, the murder weapon was believed to be a Beretta pistol, but the searches turned up very little. At the same time as the search was going on, Peter Manuel was spending money as if it were going out of fashion. This was somewhat unusual for him and he was seen buying drinks for others in local bars and gifted money to friends and family. Manuel was not regularly known for having money. Many of his acquaintances had wondered out loud where these newfound fortunes had come from. 
In the end, it was this newfound generosity which would snare Manuel. In the days before January 1st, Peter Smart had withdrawn £35 in new sequential banknotes. A barman had become suspicious of Manuel's spending. Not only was he not using his usual chip and change, but the notes he had paid with were new notes fresh from the mint. The barman reported this to the police. Police were able to check the serial numbers of the new banknotes against the withdrawal Peter Smart had made before New Year's Eve and confirmed that these notes had belonged to him. On January 14th, police searched Manuel's home at 6.45am and were able to recover items from previous burglaries as well as some of Peter Smart's sequential banknotes. Police then took the somewhat unusual step of arresting Manuel's father, Sam, for the items found in the raid. There is intense speculation that this had been pre-planned. Sam Manuel had repeatedly acted as a blocker in the investigation of his son's crimes. Removing his wit and ability to alibi his son may have elicited a reaction from Peter Manuel. And it worked. Peter Manuel contacted the local police and stated that he would take responsibility for the items found at the family home and would also help to clear up unsolved crimes in Lanarkshire in return for the release of his father. Manuel was taken into custody and questioned regarding his comments and over the murder of the Smart family. After several hours, Manuel asked for his parents to be brought to him as he would like to confess to them first. He proceeded to admit to the eight murders and told of how he murdered the Smart family around 6am on New Year's Day. He further noted that he had taken Peter Smart's car and had been driving in it in the days following. He also stated that he had stayed in the house for a few days afterwards and looked after the family's cat. He offered to lead investigators to the concealed body of Isabel Cook. Isabel's body was found on January 16, 1958, 19 days after her murder. Peter Manuel had hidden her body within Burnt Broom Farm in Mount Vernon, where he had buried her under three foot of dirt. The police could now at least return bodies to the families and enable them to begin to grieve. Given his full confession, the trial of Peter Manuel began in earnest on May 12, 1958. Given the severity of the crimes, Peter Manuel was very much aware that if his guilt were to be proven, he would be sentenced to death. Manuel ensured he brushed himself up for the occasion. Each day he wore a navy blazer with smart trousers and newspapers at the time regularly referred to him as being, quote, well turned out. Only 13 days into the trial, Manuel, ever the showman, sacked his legal team and opted to defend himself. He retained the services of only one solicitor, John Ferns, whom he instructed to sit in court and offer advice on aspects of law and aspects of law only. Despite his previous confessions, Manuel attempted to refute the charges against him in court. He stated that concerning the murder of Anne Neelands, he was not an East Bride at the time of the crime, and that the only evidence against him was a bus conductress who had given a description matching his to link him to the murder. When it came to the charges for free killings of the Watt family, Manuel stated that a criminal associate Charles Tallis was the man responsible. He claimed that Tallis had boasted about the break-ins and had shown him two 38 revolvers and later, when he had gone to Manuel's home, he had left one of the guns in a drawer along with five spent shells. Manuel then moved on to the charge against him for the murder of Isabel Cook and stated it could not have been him as he was in Glasgow at the time of the crime, however, offered no evidence to back this claim up. Manuel continued to refute charges when it came to the murders of the Smart family by stating that he had known the family since 1953. In his version of events, he had gone to the Smarts home on Peter's request as Peter was looking to source a firearm to protect himself. He continued that when he arrived, he had let himself in where he had discovered the bodies 
and in his opinion, he believed it to be a murder suicide. He went on to state that it was in fact him who had called in the murders when he hadn't heard about them in the newspaper. All of this stood in stark contrast to the confession he had made to police at the time of his arrest. Manuel had conducted a willful and robust defence of himself in court, especially for a lay member of the public. Even the judge had commended the strength of his legal defence and duration. Nonetheless, the evidence appeared damning, except for in one instance. The judge directed the jury that for the charge concerning Anne Nealens, they should reach a verdict of not guilty due to the lack of corroborating evidence. By stating this, it was clearly implied that the judge felt there to be a weight of evidence within the remaining three murder charges that a reasonable jury may opt to find Manuel guilty. By 4.50pm on May 29th, 1958, the jury had reached a verdict on all charges. On charge one, the murder of Anne Nealens, not guilty. On charge four, the Watt family murders, guilty of capital murder. On charge six, Isabel Cook, guilty of murder. On charge seven, the Smart family murders, guilty of capital murder. After the jury's verdict, Lord Cameron sentenced Manuel to death by hanging for the two capital murder charges. News reports stated that Manuel held his head low, looking at the floor and gave no grandiose reaction to the verdict. There was one further murder which was linked to Manuel, which he had always publicly denied and no charges were brought against him due to lack of evidence. Sidney John Dunn is often referred to as the forgotten victim of Peter Manuel. Dunn was a taxi driver in Newcastle, and if it were proven to have been linked to Manuel, it would be the only serious crime related to him that was committed outside of Greater Glasgow. On Sunday, December 8, 1957, in the early hours, Dunn was outside of Newcastle Central Station, waiting for a fare as two young men exited. Another man had gotten in his taxi and asked to be taken to a nearby town of Edmund Byers. This is the last known movements of Sydney. The taxi was later found at the side of the road by a policeman on a bicycle. After looking at the vehicle he realised that the interior and the exterior lights had been smashed and there was blood on the steering wheel along with a scarf lying in the grass at the side of the road. After surveying the nearby area, the policeman believed this was likely to be a road traffic accident and cycled to Edmund Byers to check if he was able to find anyone there who would be able to clear this up. However, there were no signs that whoever had been involved had been there. A search dog would later find the body of Sidney Dunn 150 metres away from the vehicle hidden in the grass. His body had been dragged by the coattails of his jacket and he had been shot in the head. There was also a five inch gash in his neck. Inquiries in nearby towns led the police nowhere and they had been unable to track exactly how the killer would have gotten away from the scene without being seen after leaving the taxi that seemed to be his only opportunity to flee. Peter Manuel is linked to the crime as he was in Newcastle on December 6th for a job interview he had with British Electrical Repairs Limited and there is no record for when he returned to Glasgow. The murder weapon was also discovered to be a 38 revolver which matched some of Manuel's previous MO. One significant difference with this crime scene was that there had been no robbery. Sidney Dunn's wallet lay untouched and nothing had been taken from the taxi. While in Berlin prison, Manuel was questioned regarding this murder and strenuously denied the allegation, stating he was being linked with every murder since Cain and Abel. However, in 2009, a poem was found in the papers of Duncan Mackenzie, the former governor of Berlin prison. The poem had been handwritten by Peter Manuel as he was awaiting his eventual execution, and it read, 
I murdered Isabella Cook and young Anne Neelands too. Shot the Watts and shot the Smarts and Sidney Dunn I slew. On June 20th, while awaiting execution, Peter Manuel managed to grab some cleaning product as a warden cleaned his cell and proceeded to swallow it in an attempt to take his own life. Prison staff were quick to act and after being rushed to the hospital to have his stomach pumped, Manuel returned to full health. Just four days later, he was to launch an appeal to try to overturn the verdicts on the criminal charges he had received. This appeal was turned down by John Maclay, the then Scottish Secretary. On July 11, 1958, Peter Manuel was to be executed. He was awoken at 6am and given his own clothes to change into. He proceeded to have breakfast at 7am and was offered a glass of whisky. At 7.30am, the chaplain visited his cell for a final blessing and at around 7.55am, the executioners arrived. Manuel's arms were pinned behind his back and he was led to the adjacent room where the noose awaited. The scaffold and the execution apparatus were not actually stored in Glasgow, having been sent from Wandsworth Prison in London by train to be built for the occasion. Loaded onto the gallows, Manuel waited on his fate. At precisely 8am, the lever was pulled and the trap door opened. Manuel was pronounced dead at 8.01am by waiting officials. It is reported that Peter Manuel's final words were, if you turn the radio up, I'll go quietly. Manuel left behind very few possessions. All that was left for his father Sam to collect was £10 and 15 shillings, a ballpoint pen, a shirt, three handkerchiefs, two ties and a broken comb. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We have been overwhelmed with the support and positivity we have received from our listeners and want to let you know that it means a lot to us. We would like to ask that if you are enjoying the podcast and haven't already done so, if you could leave us a rating and some feedback on whatever platform you listen. We welcome all feedback as we want to give our listeners exactly what they want and will continue to do just that. Also, please check out a new podcast. Folia Do, which I've been listening to recently. Amy and Dell discussed true crime with a lot of laughs, and I was glad to hear in the latest episode that they will now be producing these weekly.